Welcome to the Software Journey Podcast, a show where remarkable tech professionals and entrepreneurs talk about how they got into tech, first customers, trends, finding talent, hiring IT services vendors, work-life balance, and so much more. I'm your host, Konstantin Klagin, founder of Redwork, a software development agency helping businesses worldwide reach new heights with digital transformation and win more consumers with robust award-winning solutions. Tune in for real stories and actionable tips in the space of SaaS, Web3, DeFi and game dev. It's gonna be fun, let's go! Here with me today is the co-founder and CEO of, um, of SharpaDesk, Patrick Clemens. Uh, Patrick, thanks a lot for uh, for taking the time uh, to talk to me today, and we're gonna start with uh, with an introduction. Can you please introduce yourself? Thanks, Katzadin. Um My name is Patrick Clements. Uh, started uh, Sherpa Desk in 2012. Uh, co-founded it. Uh, we basically started it as a necessity for our first business unit. We were a network integration and IT support provider, and we needed a platform to monitor our tech commission's time, track expenses, uh, be able to track project uh, profitability. And uh, we really didn't find a fit in the market, so we developed our own solution, uh, found out that uh, there was a real need for it, for especially in the small, medium-sized space. And uh, we uh, then launched uh, Sherpa Desk. It is a professional service automation platform, which is a really mouthful for it really helps professional services manage their time and their billing and their contracts and be able to get paid quickly. Um, and so, uh, yeah, we've uh, launched it in yeah 2012 and have been expanding in multiple markets. Currently, we uh, service mostly IT support managed service providers, but uh, we also work in the financial industry, um, banking, uh, real estate, and software development and uh, graphic design. All right. And so why did you call it Sherpa? Well, uh, we actually, uh, like full transparency, we, we, we took a, um, a play out of the Zendesk playbook. We really wanted to get something that, you know, our first business units were very business stiff, if you will. Uh, and we knew we wanted to service more of the small to medium sized market. So we wanted to get something a little bit more marketable, a little bit more tangible. Uh, one of our friends uh, drew us a uh, sherpa for as as an icon as a logo and uh we felt that like oh okay well that that could actually resonate uh at the time zendesk had a buddha right that if you launched uh was sure that they even sent you like the sound machine we we actually had the same thing we sent um a yeti hat uh if you ever got like one of our fail pages uh so sherpa desk kind of resonated a little bit with us i'm pretty outdoorsy i do a lot of um hiking um and we felt like this could be a guide to help you achieve like awesome customer success and awesome um, platform to like really take you to the next level. So we just doubled down on it. Um, one again, as uh, one of our friends developed the icon and we're like, all right, uh, let's just kind of follow how Zendesk did it. All right. Well, th- this uh, word actually pops up uh, every time you hear about someone climbing uh, Everest. Has anyone yes. from your team done it? Yes. No, I mean, uh, I think in my younger days, I would uh, have attempted at least to try to base camp. But these days, I mostly keep it on ski hills. That's about as much uh, mountaineering I'm going to get into. Um, but uh, no, I mean, I, I do find mountaineering amazing. And I found what the, the, the people, the indigenous people, Sherpas do for, you know, um, to help people do reach these life goals. I think it's super amazing. But uh, no, I think those ambitions have probably gone away <laughs> as I've gotten older. And like yourself, I just had a daughter, uh, so it's like I feel like I've got more to rely on. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I just got a tattoo with my daughter's name here. <laughs> oh, there you go. How, and, and what is she like? Two? How old is she? She's eight month old. Eight month old. Okay, so I'm like literally four weeks old. Ah, uh, like, congratulations! Super, hot, 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 hot super fresh. fresh. Yeah. What's the name? Uh, her name is Sky. Sky. All right. That's actually, that is uh, close to what I named my daughter. Uh, mine is Cassiopeia, like the constellation. Oh, man. That's a beautiful name. Thank you. Uh, are you calling her Cassiopeia or are you calling her Cassie or Cass? Or... Ca- Cassiopeia is the full name and the passport. And, uh, well, we call her Cassie. Okay, cool. Love it. 
<laughs> all right, all right. So yeah, uh, in uh, in every company, being the CEO means a different set of uh, responsibilities. What's uh, what? What are your responsibilities in at Sherpa Desk as a CEO? A lot of it is just product vision. Um, you know, it's like I came back from I came from a um, an engineering background, so I get really deep into the weeds as far as like product design, product, um, uh, the future of the project, where we can see the, the project heading. Uh, and I, uh, I also have an art background. So a lot of it is really based on the designing of the, um, the features and functionality. Uh, I don't actually do any of the coding anymore. Uh, my coding is super rusty. Uh, so I would say majority of my, uh, my day-to-day task is in with the product development team. However, uh, I do sit on top of as far as like, you know, working with uh, potential investors. You know, we, we, we're still a, um, a private company and we still haven't, uh, taken on any institutional capital. And so this has always been something that, uh, you know, we kind of evaluate with our existing, our existing board as far as like how to, to scale the company. So a lot of my time is also dedicated towards like, okay, um, packaging the company to available for, uh, some initial investment, but at this time right now, we, you know, we we have a steady growth rate. We have, uh, you know, an, an excellent client base. So it's, uh, we're really kind of determining where to go with that. Um, but yeah, so it's either working with the product development team or working with the board to decide on how we're going to scale, uh, the, the business is a majority of my time. And then I'll work with some of our key customers on just understanding like what they need to get out of the system. Um, and and see how we can help uh, make them become successful. But I usually leave that side of it to like um, the customer success team. All right, all right. Tell me more about your arts background because I went to an art school uh, to did ten years, and yeah. my dad is a painter. He's a teacher of painting at the Academy of Arts in Harvey. Okay, yeah. Uh, so I started uh, my art path when I was in eighth grade. Uh, so I really had a desire to be more of a graphic artist and um, went to school uh, in Georgia to study uh, commercial art and design. Uh, I got all the way up into my junior year and um, it became like a career path, right? So you go to your, your counselor and say, hey, you know, I want to go into the um, commercial art and design path. And you know, she, she was pretty honest. She was brutal and said that, hey, you know, it's like this is a pretty competitive field and the chance of you actually, you know, making, you know, financial wealth is pretty limited. And it's you really got to decide if you really want to do this. And at this time, it was my junior year in college and uh, we had just started our first company, which is this network integration IT support company with my co-founder. And, um, and we were still, we were starting to take off pretty decently as far as like setting up wider networks, software networks for, uh, government organizations, city municipalities. And I really kind of decided like maybe, you know, going down that, that, uh, art path was not really, uh, my future. And I moved to a business degree and decided to finish my collegiate career, uh, doing business and, and marketing and then focusing on this new startup that we just launched out of college. Um, so with that being said, uh, my art is really kind of more of a hobby now. Um, I do some art projects on the side and, um, and I guess I get a little bit of my, um, scratch the itch when I get to do product design in, inside the application. But, um, yeah, um, my foundation was back in the passion of art. All right. All right. Now uh, let's uh, get back to Sherpa desk. Um, mm-hmm. It's a PSA software. Can you explain in simple terms what PSA is for those who are not familiar with the with it with the acronym? Right. So uh, it's just a product category. Uh, just when they try to box everything into a solution. So it stands for professional service automation. Um, and really, what that is is it's a platform for professional services. And we define professional services as anybody that uses time and billing as their main revenue driver. So think of anybody that does uh, project work, that does time and billing, um, which would be IT support people, graphic designers, software developers. Uh, so they use our application to support their customers, log their time against uh, a contract or against expense, and then be able to log expenses and then be able to get paid for them. Uh, so we have the 
really one of the secret sauces about uh, Sherpadesk is the customization of the di- multiple contracts that you can have with your customers. Pretty impressive about the different types of billing that people will um, employ uh, against their customer base. And so we have adapted the system to really uh, mimic or cater to any type of uh, uh, time of billing that uh, any industry needs or any organization needs, whether it's um, a fixed rate contract or a flat fee contract, or if it's uh, prepaid hours, if you're selling on units versus time. Uh, so we, we pretty much covered the gambit on that. And then allowing you to be able to log and capture that time, either through email, through the web app, through um, the mobile uh, interface. Uh, so we really want to try to help these uh, these guys be able to capture that time so that they can get paid, send out their invoices and get paid for doing it. All right. Sounds like a typical billing uh, approach in, uh, in the outsourcing business. Well, yes, um, that's right. Yeah. So how is Sherpa Desk different from all-in-one CRM solutions like Zendesk? Well, so Zendesk is a, is a great tool. Uh, it's a, it's a cus- customer support tool, right? It allows you to manage and um, report and receive and um, resolve customer support issues, right? And then um, Sherpa Desk has that component. It's, it's basically a, a typical help desk or customer support component. Where we're different from like CRM systems, we are like a CRM system for in CRM's customer relationship management for professional services, meaning we allow you to not only support and service your customers, but able to track your time against that support and be able to uh, get paid for it. So where we're different is we combine uh, a customer support tool, a time tracking tool, a project management tool, a resource allocation tool, and an asset management tool all into one platform. And it's done in a way that it's uh, affordable for small and medium-sized businesses, uh, and that uh, it's easy to set up. So there's not any uh, lengthy contracts. There's not uh, a long onboarding cycle. It's it's an intuitive, self-service, self-setup type so, uh, solution. All right. And Sherpa Desk works on the freemium uh, business model. Is that is it is that true? Yeah, that's correct. So if you're a single technician and all you need to do is log your time and expenses against a, an account and be able to send an invoice and integrate it into your QuickBooks online, you can use Sherpa Desk for free. Our goal is to like really uh, allow these uh, you know single entrepreneurs to be able to scale and grow their business. And then as they scale and grow their business, we can scale and grow with them. They'll begin to add more technicians, they'll add contractors, they'll expand their functionality and as they you know, become more successful we want or we help them uh, become more successful then we'll grow with them um, so yeah so a single technician license with the uh, the base uh, package it's free for life all right uh, so speaking of the business model freemium models can be tricky have you experienced any challenges in turning uh, free users into paid subscribers that's sure for this yeah i mean that's yeah it's 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 a conversation we have on our monthly stand up every uh, every week is um, you know we're starting to get to see a little bit of a top heavy of freemium uh, so where we got more freemium customers that are demanding um, you know features and functionalities and support and they're not paying versus you know us not being able to spend more of that time and, and consideration on our paying customers um, so it is it is a um, uh, I guess a growing pain with the freemium model um, you know some of the things that we are discussing internally is you know what does that look like as we grow um, you know some of the things is is uh, should we begin uh, minimizing some of the access of the functionality, right? Like h- how can we reduce some of the application by still honoring our free for uh, uh, life or the, the first technician? And so, yeah, so it's like some of the things that are on the table is like, all right, should we allow integrations um, with our premium users? Uh, should we um, allow our premium users to have multiple contracts? Maybe we only allow them to have one contract. Is continue to like really provide a value for freemiums because we want them to be successful. We want them to grow, but also we understand that there's a, there's a business need for us to, to continue to service our customers that are paying and that, um, and that are providing, you know, revenue growth for us. So, yeah, um, I, I don't have the, uh, like the solid answer as far as like, you know, how to, you know, really execute a premium model successfully. Uh, I just know that uh, using it as a marketing tool to help, us integrate into, you know, there's a huge divide between free and $1, right? It's like, 
if if something is free and one dollar, that's that's totally that's two different types of models, right? And so, um, you know, we we feel that like with the freemium model, we can get some marketing uh, application out of it. We can get growth. It shows scale and it allows us to, um, you know, really continue to provide that for, uh, MVP, that uh, minimum viable product to the uh, the marketplace to help us grow. Monetizing it is something that we're, it's still a, a, a I guess a, a learning in progress right now. All right. You mentioned that you grow with your customers, right? So whenever mm-hmm. a single engineer becomes successful and starts hiring people, uh, they uh, they convert from freemium to uh, from free model to 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 paid subscription. Uh, what do you consider a good conversion rate for freemium, and uh, are you on target with that? Yeah. So I mean, even going back, we're, we're seeing people convert. They've been with us over three years. Uh, they've been using the application, and then. They finally convert like three years. Uh, we say anything that over like six months is, is kind of an older account that convert right now. We're converting a little less than 20%. Um, and do I think that's a good conversion rate? No. Um, I think it would be great if we could get more of a 50 50. So 50% of our customers are paying 50% of them are on the premium model. Uh, and that's basically where our conversation goes on Monday. And when we do our standups, like how do we start moving the um, the lever more towards a, a 50-50 share? And again, a lot of that's limiting the application, limiting some of the integrations, uh, you know, promoting some of the other paid features that maybe they didn't know ex- existed as far as like, you know, custom domain or custom email um, setup or asset management. So yeah, it's like uh, right now we're we're right around like 18%. Uh, of conversion um and some of these and again some of these guys were converting may have been with us over three years and they're, they're, they're finally converting um i do see that as kind of a win because they've been with us for so long all right all right and what's uh, what uh, strategies have you tried to increase the conversion rates have you tried the uh, lowering uh, prices to penetrate the markets well so pricing is never going to be an issue for us um we feel like we're providing um a high value for a very uh, affordable price point. Um, and I would think that like um, if anybody would consider like not converting because of, uh, of our price point, they're probably not going to be the best customer anyways. Um, you know, cause we, you know, we look, we keep a pretty good eye on, on a lot of the, uh, the PSA solutions out there. And, and as far as our price point, we're, uh, if not uh, competitive, maybe a little bit more of a, uh, of a value and economically. So it's, pricing is never going to be an issue uh, for us. It's mostly going to be awareness, um, access, awareness that the uh, that we exist, that the certain features and functionalities exist. Um, you know, what type of access do they get for the price point? And you know, constantly uh, putting them into this automated journey of um, letting them know of uh, uh, the features and functionalities that they can employ that can move them to the paid subscription, whether it be like barcode scanning, or it could be um, LDAP integration, or it could be, you know, adding a contractor that you didn't know you could add, um, um, you know, for a limited design basis, even though, um, you, you know, they're not a full-time uh, employee. So just education, uh, awareness, um, you know, looking to like maybe uh, restrict access to certain features, functionalities, integrations, continue to promote uh, more of a, a, a paid model subscription for these users. So uh, let's talk about the competition. Uh, usually on this SaaS market, there is a fierce competition. Who are your main com- competitors? Well, so we really break it down like three buckets. Um, since we use a lot of the uh, the, the SMB markets as our, as our primary focus so the first one we have to to deal with is basically homegrown solutions um that would be like spreadsheets email um uh tools that they've kind of hatched together to try to uh to do time tracking or to do customer support you know these are you know disjointed systems that just don't uh they 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 can't scale and they have growing pains so that's one um and we're just you know basically replacing email uh the second one is people that are trying to integrate a bunch of third-party solutions and try to make it fit, right? So they want to have a, a remote management system. They want to have a help desk system. They want to have an asset, ma- asset management system. They want to have a time tracking system. And so they have a bunch of these disparate systems and then they're trying to like 
uh, scale their business and try to get visibility of all the data across all these platforms. And they'll use either API integrations and it's just clunky. So that's the second one. That's the second type of competition that we kind of work against is the uh, a bunch of different solutions trying to be cobbled together to scale the business. And then ultimately, there's the, uh, you know, the the stalwarts of the of the industry, the, the the industry leaders, the big gorillas that uh, that really tailor towards more of the uh, SME and enterprise space, um, which we as the the application has developed uh, and matured, um, we're starting to bring on a lot more of those enterprise level customers, which is great, um, especially from a revenue growth standpoint. So um, you know, looking at those kind of three different levels of um, competition. Um, the ones that we really, really try to focus on now is really the, the, the people that um, are using combined licenses to, to support their organization. And what we try to sell them on is like, hey, why don't you look at uh, Sherbetes as a, as a kind of a one-stop shop for all your uh, back office uh, needs and supporting your customers. And so uh, we have a very sales, on, uh, sales techniques on going against those. And then the second one is uh, really focusing on um, these enterprise level space. And what we want to do is try to carve out like the bottom 10% of say the auto tasks, the connected wise, um, even um, looking at like um, Halo PSA and saying, hey, like, uh, I know you guys are disgruntled. You can go to Reddit and you can see all the different um, reasons on why they're not really happy with these type of solutions. And so that's when we would like to come in and say, hey, check us out. There's no contracts. Uh, there's no um, onboarding fees. Support and maintenance are rolled into your contracts uh, or rolled into your service. You can scale or retract your uh, licenses as you see fit. So it's a new like paradigm shift with a lot of these uh, these businesses that are looking to have a different alternative than say getting in bed with these guys that have like large contracts and long onboarding cycles. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question or if you're looking for specific uh, competitors, but those are the three that are the three different like lanes that we try to, to choose or to, to, to sell against, I guess, or sell for uh, when we're, we're talking to customers. Well, speedy onboarding certainly sounds um, disruptive. For the market, that's uh, this. Yeah, market. yeah. It's especially like uh, in some of these older legacy systems that are like very bloated. Um, where we really try to like uh, be a differentiator is um, onboarding and customer support. You know, a lot of these people they'll they'll write these uh, checks and they'll start, sign up for these multi year contracts, and then they feel like they've just been ghosted on um, onboarding and setup and support and. You know, it's six months into their contract and they still haven't been able to roll out the deployment. And that's like, to me, that's that's ridiculous. Um, so it's like uh, we're the anti that, if you will. Um, we can get you uh, set up and rolling and uh, time tracking and invoicing and managing your customer responses within the same week. So um, that that's disruption. I don't know. That's a that's a pretty strong word, but uh, it's a market uh it's a market necessity or a market like need that um, we're looking to fill. And uh, anywhere along your journey with the product, did you have to pilot the idea to, to pivot? Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, our piloting uh, was actually was pretty fortuitous, I guess, because uh, uh, as I mentioned, we we started a network integration IT support company uh, right out of college, and and we really kept that going for the uh, few years. There was uh, a lot of uh, federal money that was going into allowing. Um, that K-12 school, city municipalities, organizations to get up on the internet, kind of date myself a little bit. And so uh, we would pick up a lot of these contracts and um, implement the wider networks, local networks, databases, uh, email servers. And then we would have technicians that would provide, uh, you know, IT support and we'd be a, a managed service provider with a, a set contract, right? So when we first developed the solution, we just rolled it out to our existing customers uh, and to our existing team. That was our pilot. We basically, the, the term is we were eating our own dog food and gotten a lot of feedback on how this should work in a, you know, a live environment. And then we packaged it up and coined it as Sherpa Desk. And then um, we had an existing customer base with our um, existing contracts. But then we rolled it out to um, some uh, like a beta set of, uh, of customers that were also interested that weren't using our IT support services, but had their own local IT support teams that were interested in rolling it out or interesting testing it out. So we just had a natural beta environment from there. And uh, yeah, 
it, that's where we got great success and we saw that there was a market need and we ended up sunsetting that uh, IT support business and really going doubling down and going all into the Sherpa Desk platform. Right. And speaking of your users, uh, have user demands changed since uh, 2012 when you founded Sherpa Desk compared to now? Oh, man. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> It's like, yeah, it's lots changed. Um, you know, initially it was just, uh, we needed a customer support tool. That's where it originally started out as. And then, um, then they needed, uh, time tracking and billing and then they needed integrations. The integrations have like been anywhere from accounting integrations to active directory integrations, LDAP integrations. You know, this is like the, the big wave, which was like, how do you, how are you going to play nicely with our third party, in, uh, um, tools right and so so we went on a big api uh binge and and started integrating into um the remote management tools uh their uh their email uh parser systems and so the integration was the next that you know the second wave of like requests you know as as things became more like data started living more on the web now um the big request, and I think it's part of one of our initial conversation was, is like, how is AI going to get involved in the platform? And like, how can we use AI to like service our customers or roll out, you know, you know, tier one support? Uh, so I feel like AI is the next evolution in our platform on not only from us managing the platform, but us uh, allowing AI to be used from a, a customer service standpoint. And so that's one of the things that we're really looking as the next evolution for um, us as a team and as the, the platform. So feature design is, is driven by user requests, right? What's the threshold? How many users have to request a feature uh, to, to get it implemented? So, yeah, so um, that's it's always say it's always says it's it's a slippery slope. Um, you know, we used to call it feature creep, but I'm sure it's it's still like around is like you never want to like continue to over customize a solution where it's not able to be used again. Um, and you know it's a very tricky situation where you have a super big customer that wants a certain feature, right? And then you're like, all right, do we design this feature for this customer because it's uh, you know it has a big revenue windfall, or do we um, like put a pause and say, hey, does this feature uh, service our entire customer base and our market, right? So that's always a very uh, um, a tricky subject. And where we've kind of landed on is. We can't let squeaky wheels drive our development. Um, we learned that a long time ago. Um, and so what happens is when we get feature requests, they all go into these little buckets. We, they're called our feature enhancement buckets. And we have different areas of the uh, of the application. We have projects, we have tickets, we have um, assets, we have uh, calendaring to-dos. And so you put uh, the features and functionalities go into these uh, enhancement queues. Um, then once a quarter, we review, uh, we, we, we kind of, we have our technicians that have their certain um, places in the app that they work on, right? Um, we have an integration app. We have a mobile uh, uh, mobile development app uh, engineer. We have a guy that handles most of our uh, accounting and, uh, and third-party integrations. So we, we go through basically once a quarter and go through all these different enhancement queues. And we decide like, okay, say it's Igor, you know, and his uh, his project load is actually being um, completed in this quarter. Then we'll look into his the enhancement queue for what Igor is assigned and say, hey, which ones have been requested the most and what has the most value, has the least amount of risk uh, and the lowest amount of effort, right? Those are like the three big triggers that we're kind of looking for. And then we just make a... a, a an executive decision is then, hey, what about the rest of the market? I know these customers want it, but what about the rest of the market? And so we put a score on it and then we say, okay, then these, this feature set, these things will get included into the development roadmap for the next quarter and then get assigned to Igor. And then we do, do that for all of our, our different uh, development units. And, um, you know, some development units, it may take them two quarters to actually finish it. Like we're currently working on a total redesign on our, um, our, on our ticket work list page. And so that's taking two to quarters. And so any, anything for the tickets aspect, it's just, it's just paused until we can get this rolled, this rolled out. But yeah, it's just, it's, um, it's kind of measured on effort and risk and availability of our development team. But we really do try to like uh, hedge against uh, these squeaky wheels and these and and this 
because we understand where the platform itself is more important than the customer. Um, and we don't want to get in this, like, you know, having all of our eggs in one basket kind of thing. Right. And is your, uh, does your decision making on, on new features involve any customer development? Do you uh, interview do you your customer? customers about their, uh, their, oh, yeah, yeah. The, the expectations uh, from a particular uh, teacher that you, oh, yeah, for list? sure. They, the customers stay involved in the process. So say they interview or say they, uh, they submit us a, in a feature enhancement request, right? And so it's for this, let's call it uh, depreciation on assets. They need a depreciation model on assets. And we start accumulating a bunch of um, uh, requests for like, hey, we want to be able to depreciate capital expenses on your assets. I was like, okay, this is a big request. Um, and and our asset uh, development team is ready to take, a, take it on. Then yes, we'll keep these guys uh, clued in uh, the, the the customers that have uh, uh, added uh, the enhancer request. We'll we'll in, we'll um, we'll query them. We'll interview them. And, says, and we'll send them screenshots. We'll send them mockups to say, "What about? Is this what you need? Is this how it looks?" And we'll have an open dialogue. They'll stay attached through the process until we actually close out the uh, the enhancer request. It gets put to beta, and then we post it to uh, production. Once we post it to production, they'll get an alert that says, "Hey." This feature request is available for you to test now. And so they'll actually go in there and test and give us any kind of like initial response and feedback. Um, and then we'll also post the release notes to our portal to let other people know that, that, that the uh, the feature is available. But yeah, the customers uh, do stay attached throughout the process because they're the ones that are using it. Now, we don't give them direct access to the developer because that's uh, a slippery slope. So uh, usually myself or one of the other product is, uh, develop designers um, actually uh, is, a, is an intermediary between the requirement gathering and then actually pushing off the, uh, the, re the requirements to the development team. And how many companies and individual subscribers are using Sherpa Desk daily? We have just under about a thousand uh, customers um, and we're close to, I believe, like 80,000 uh, active users. And when we say active users, that's anybody that has a license in the system and that has uh, logged in or interfaced with the system within the last seven days. Yeah. Uh, and that's where I was kind of alluding to earlier is we have an amazing uh, customer base. Uh, we have a, de a decent growth trajectory. And so... You know, when you take on institutional capital, it, it becomes a slippery slope on like how you are able to service existing customers, and you know what is your growth trajectory now that uh, you're taking on capital. But uh, yeah, um, we, we, you know, our churn rate is probably somewhere around the neighborhood of like ninety or like seven percent, and so we have a renewal rate of about ninety three percent year over year. So yeah, we're pretty excited and uh, the direction of the company, especially the team. And uh, yeah. So tell me about how you attracted your first 1,000 uh, uh, customers. Well, we scratched, scratched, clawed, bled. Um, <laughs> I mean, we did everything to try to get those customers. You know, it's like, that's really like getting an MVP, I think out there is not as hard as everybody thinks it is because I, once you kind of identified a problem, uh, there's somebody else that definitely has a problem. So getting that kind of a, uh, uh, adoption is, uh, is not, in my opinion, not that big of a hurdle i mean everybody says that's the biggest hurdle but it's not that big of a hurdle what's a hurdle is scaling a business um that is really where it's i'm not i'm not even saying that we we've, we've, we've even figured it out um it's you've got to look to see it's like okay where do you who are your customers right like you know how where do they um where do they operate uh, what and you got to get micro um definitive on that like are they this size? Are they in this location? Are they, uh, who is the buyer? And then trying to find out like, okay, is that particular market, is that big enough for us to have a viable business? Can we scale that business? And once we've kind of defined that and say, and for us, it was the small to medium sized businesses and IT support and managed ser service providers. We initially started off in, uh, like North America, but we've spent, um, expanded to English speaking countries. Um, you know, trying to really put a box on what we are. The only reason that is because um, there's a lot of like localization requests that we were getting from, you know, say Spanish speaking countries or French speaking countries or Asian speaking countries. And like, we just didn't have the resources to do localization. So we just put a box on it. Um, and then uh, finding out like, okay, now that we've understand that this market's big enough and we can scale it and that they have the need, how are we going to attract them? Do you 
Uh, do you do uh, web to lead? Do you do ad based marketing? Do you do SEO, SEM, or do you do, or is it uh, warrant enough to uh, implement an inbound uh, and an outbound sales team to go out and do your hunting for you? And um, and so we we've, we've experimented with actually all the models, um, and where we've really landed on for us to scale the business for now um, at the SMB level is uh an seo sem uh, we don't really have an outbound sales team and we we cultivate leads through uh, email marketing uh, we cultivate leads through um uh ad-based uh, uh revenue through you know google linkedin facebook um and then once they're in the the journey then we we do email marketing and try to like get them to convert to um from trial to uh, paid customers. So that's how we got to the first, you know, just under a thousand customers. Now, as the platform is beginning to expand, some of the conversations we're having is, does it make more sense for us to like, let that engine continue to go and we'll continue to, to service and market it and support it. And then now let's move, see if we can move more up market uh, into the bigger customer space. And so we're just having those conversations now. Um, we feel like we have a great base and we got a good customer base that's keeping us, you know, moving forward. And now to scale it, let's go into the enterprise space. And so that's that's something that I'm currently interested in as far as um, learning how to do as far as putting together an outbound sales team to really hunt and um, nurture leads. Uh, I'm a big fan of account based marketing. So so yeah, that's that's kind of what we're looking to do now is like taking our growth to uh, I guess more of the enterprise level space. All right. Well, in, inbound and uh, yeah, inbound is a, is, a, is is the best. Uh, way to acquire users that's for sure it is well it is especially at our price points and our and to be able to maintain margins it's the only way for us to initially scale but once we start looking at like more higher end revenue type customers uh we know that it may make more sense we're we're not there yet but may make more sense to do like outbound or have an um, internal sales team to do account-based marketing uh, stay tuned. I'll let you know how that goes within the, the next 12 months. All right. All right. I'll check back with you. All right. Uh, All right. Recently, you have received the Remarkable Quality Award from QA for, uh, since we couldn't find any major or medium sever severity bugs in your product. What's the secret to such a great product quality? What does your uh, testing process look like? So we uh, uh, we have a great development team. That's I mean, it starts with it, those guys. Um, a lot of the, the guys have been here with us for over 10 years. Um, um, I think, I don't know if we mentioned it on the call, but they're 80% uh, of our team is based out of Eastern Europe, mostly in Ukraine. Um, and these guys, first of all, they just do good work. They, uh, uh, We have one uh, systems engineer that is totally dedicated to reliability uh, security um, maintenance of the application. So he makes sure that the database structure is architecturally sound, it's scalable, and it creates a, a solid foundation for the other uh, engineers to develop on top of it. As far as like when we introduce new features and functionalities, uh, we use a little bit an idle method, um, which is maybe have gone a little bit by the wayside, but we package all of our um, releases into a release that goes into a beta format and then from there it gets uh heavily qa'd with uh, uh like regression testing and user-based testing i personally test a lot of the application itself before it gets released to uh, production uh now with that being said is do we release things that uh have issues yes uh, this is so when we do our release cycle we do not have any, we have everything open after that. So it's like for the next literally uh, week, we are totally uh, watching and paying attention to uh, the application as far as like uh, reliability, um, sustainability. Is there any type of a UI, UX, uh, hard failures? And we immediately uh, are able to do hot fixes. So with that being said is we do do a good job of uh, releasing a sound application. One is we understand that this application is 
basically the entire like business model for our business application for our customers. If they are unable to um, log their time, they are unable to service their customers, that negatively affects them. So um, we understand as long as our customers' customers are happy, then our customers are happy. So there's that impetus of always releasing good quality sound code. But if we don't, be able to resolve it very quickly. Um, so with that being said, uh, we we do have application development. Then it goes to QA. We QA it for about about a week. And then we we'll usually release on a Thursday. We have the same time. It's a Thursday around 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning. Uh, so it's kind of a, a light release. Um, and then because most of our customers are in North America, and then we monitor for the next uh, three to seven days. Uh, if there's any type of issues, bugs, uh, then we usually are able to get hot fixes out pretty quickly. Do you employ any dedicated QA engineers and testers in your team? Yeah, so we have one QA uh, engineer and then myself uh, that will review the uh, the release. Uh, it's that, not, that is, it's not that a, is impressive. That is impressive yeah. for, uh, for the product of such, well, we, such magnitude. Uh, yeah, it's, it's very small yeah, the theory. application... But we don't do huge releases either. Um, in fact, uh, we try to keep the releases pretty small. We do a release about, um, we do usually maintenance releases about once every two weeks. And then we'll do a, a major release about once a quarter. So we're about to come up to our major release, which is, um, that's always a very tense time um, because it is such a heavy release. We do try to do um, more QA on it um, on these types of quarterly releases. But um, again, Historically, we've had a pretty good uh, success record on releasing quality code. What's your opinion on, on outsourcing? Do you outsource any of, of your IT services, of your IT work in general? Uh, well, I, I mean, I think I explained to you earlier. So um, a lot of people would see that uh, our development is outsourced, but it's 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 really not. Uh, these are full-time so our development team is mostly in Ukraine and in Russia. Um, and then we have other contractors that are in like Argentina for, this is not on the development side, but on, on the marketing side um, in England and in Argentina and um, and in Canada. Uh, so we have like people that do, um, you know, like content development for us or graphic design. Uh, our graphic designer is actually in Malta. But like for our development team, and I would consider those guys outsource, right? Like anything that's non-dev, uh, that's are in like remote areas, that's um, those are contractors. But for our dev team, these are our full-time employees. Uh, they work directly with us. Uh, and I'd like to say they're, they would be uh, just like any other employee that's sitting next to me in an office. They just live on another part of the world. So I'm a big fan of outsourcing. Um, anytime we need to scale up some type of capabilities, we're, we'll outsource. Like we, we needed uh, to have a database uh, architecture review our current system. We were having a little bit of scalability issues. Um, and so we were looking to employ like just an independent DBA to just to kind of help us review and give us some feedback. And so they uh, re reviewed our, um, our structure and architecture gave us some recommendations, and then we deployed it. Um, same thing with a uh, mobile application. We have a mobile application developer, but we needed some, we needed to like kind of hit it a little bit harder and create a whole new mobile application. So we outsourced a mobile application development team. They kind of did the, the first V1 uh, requirements UI, uh, and then we just took it back in house. And now we have our mobile application developer in um, Ukraine that's manages uh most of the application, uh, we still leverage some of that um, that outsourcing uh, third party, but uh, mostly we do it in house. So um, to answer your question, I'm I'm a big fan of uh, outsourcing and and globalization. And is that vendor that you use for uh, uh, the mobile development work? Uh, where, where are they from? They're from the U.S. Uh, they have an um, office down in Huntington Beach, but. With that being said, they also, uh, their team, so their core team is here in the U.S., uh, I think between uh, Miami and Huntington Beach, California. But when we were working with them through Slack, two of the guys were from Ukraine and one guy was from Argentina. So they were, so we were outsourcing them and I'm sure they were outsourcing uh, their development team. All right, like I said, so I'm a big fan. Yeah. So tell me more about your experience working with the uh, Ukrainian developers. Oh, man. Um, well, I mean, first of all, they're kind of like 
family. Um, you know, we've been around, like I've, you know, I, we celebrate their kids' birthday. I've been to their houses. Um, you know, it's like, uh, we wish each other like happy birthdays. It's like, it's, it's, you know, we've known these guys forever. They've been here. We've been there. Um, so as far as like working with them on a per- personal level, they're amazing guys. I mean, they're like, I say guys, uh, one girl, we do have one female developer as well. Um, but, um, but as far as like, as far as their professional, uh, acumen, it's, it's amazing. Um, you know, we, we had to, you know, what they say, you, you had to crack a few eggs to get to the good ones, you know, not, not to say that we've had, um, success in all of our development hours. Um, you know, we've had, you know, ones that have not worked out so well and we've had to let them go. And some have, you know, gone on and started their own things and, you know, some have come and gone, but now we've gotten down to a core team that really have, um, you know, they find autonomy in work. They find, um, you know, happiness and success and what they're doing. They get excited in the, in the, you know, the, the development they're, they're into, um, you know, the, the application engineer, we just, uh, we, uh, you know, just converted to a new platform. So it's like, he was super stoked to, to, to learn that new system. Um, you know, we're currently kicking out the idea of introducing AI into the application. So they're pretty excited about learning these new technologies and they take ownership of, of their, their domain. Right. Um, like Vladimir is like, he is the end all be all on releases. Like, you know, we don't do releases without Vladimir's okay. Right. And so, yeah, my opinion of them is like, uh, if any of them, if any of this, this, this core team that we have now, these, um, these 12 engineers, if any of them decided that they were like, Oh, I want to do something else or, or like whatever, I would probably be on a plane tomorrow. I was like, to go to Ukraine and say like, what's going on? You know, it's like, you know, the, these guys, uh, and, oh, and, and another thing that I think is pretty important is they, they participate in, um, the upside of the company. It's very hard for us to, to, to do an equity investment, but what we do is a profit share. And so, um, we have a scheduled percentage that we, uh, we pay out every month to these guys so that, uh, allow them to participate in the company and the upside of the company. So uh, I think that's important because uh, not only do we appreciate their time and work, but we want them to be successful too, you know, as individuals. And uh, are, are you also being transparent with the company revenue on a monthly basis? So they, they know that they get a certain percentage of... Uh, the, oh, yeah, the yeah, we have, yeah, we have we have total transparency. Um, yeah, and yeah, it's, you know, it's constantly going up the right way. So it's, it's good for them. Yeah, we have total transparency. And they... they um, they're not like abstracted in like these little silos. They're on company wide messages. They they know our growth. They can they can see the data metrics. Uh, there's nothing that's super hidden. Um, so they have uh, they have complete visibility in, into the the like we're pretty flat as far as our organization chart here. You know we're not that big of a company uh, as far as like a headcount. And so yeah, it's a uh, yeah. I don't. That's not yeah. And what's the percentage rate range and um, an average developer can get? That's sure for this. As far as the growth, and so we what we basically well, it's basically ten percent, and then we we take ten percent of the, the profits, and then we spread it out across the um, the entire team. And then um, the the way that we kind of um, hedge against like the new guys against the old guys is we just bump the pay up of, of the older guys. So, so as every year we try to uh, increase like the uh the pay rate of each of the developers and so uh the ones that have been around the longest you know they're they're ahead of the ones that um uh, that have you know that just may have come on in the last three three to five years all right so so an average uh, developer is getting is one percent of the of the total uh from, yeah from monthly paid out monthly yeah that's about right and tell me about the women representation in tech what's the male to female ratio in the company well so um, so we have a, a female, um, uh, marketing and sales lady, uh, girl, uh, she's been with us for about two years. And then we have Anastasia, uh, who's Ukrainian and she does most of our HTML, uh, does a lot of our coding for the website and the, the front ends of the application. And so then it pretty much tailors off after that. We, we, we have some contract, uh, females that do, um, some writing for us, uh, for content development. But other than that, we've seen it be mostly 
predominantly a male. Uh, dr- like most of our uh, team is uh, engineers and into the product development space. And so we we don't have a huge, um, especially when it comes to resumes and stuff and we're looking to do hiring, we never get a huge influx of um, female developers. But with that being said, I've seen um, in other companies and other, um, you know, in like these small groups of um, SaaS development companies, and th- they've seen quite a bit of in, uh, uptick in uh, product development uh, engineers. And so um, personally, you know, obviously having a daughter and like uh, I'm a big fan of like STEM programs, um, I would like to see that trend continue. All right. Well, in, in my company is uh, about half of this stuff is um, uh Women are better than we are. You do good on well, you. I, his, historically, historically, yeah, so, good on you. I, I mean, like I said, it's like I, it's. I, I know that we could definitely, especially from like a, an idea or thought process. Like I think having a, a more weighted uh, female to male balance is important. You know, because I, like I think just traditionally. You know, men think a certain way and women think another way. And so it's like it's and a lot of our customers are actually um, CIOs and CTOs. And we've seen a big uptick in that space as far as like our customers being more uh, female dominated. And so um, being able to reflect that into our team is is important. Um, so uh, we do evaluate that like when we do new hires um, to, to make sure that we have a little bit more diversity in our voices. All right, all right. So let's talk about the uh, IT job market in the USA. There have been m- massive tech layoffs in twenty uh, yeah. twenty three th- this year, and um, as a consequence, is it easier to hire IT professionals now? Well, we haven't really. Uh, we're kind of at a stage that we're not really hiring right now. Um, we haven't really hired anybody, I guess, in the last two years. Ever since COVID mm. um, is kind of when we we had a really um, expansive year in COVID, which was super bizarre. And, um, and I think a lot of that is teams went virtual and they were looking for virtual tools. So, uh, we were kind of really fit that mold. Um, so, uh, COVID was, uh, you know, this sounds bad, but COVID was good for us. Um, and then, um, once we kind of came out of, COVID, so we did, did some hiring in COVID during the time of COVID, uh, once, uh, the pandemic was over, we've kind of, not flattened out, but we've kind of uh, returned back to a more of a modest growth or, or traditional growth. So we haven't really needed to really bring on anybody new at this point. With that being said, I do have a lot of friends in the tech space uh, and a lot of um, peers and colleagues that are, they're pretty nervous right now. Um, I have one friend that uh, actually is leaving um, the United States and going to Denmark because he can't find work here. And he found an opportunity to, um, you know, um, work in Denmark. And it was more, and he just, you know, he was just surveying the, uh, the marketplace and saying, you know, it's like, I just don't see me getting a job here anytime soon. Um, I've had quite a few uh, friends in the tech space get laid off from some of the bigger tech companies and, they're still looking for jobs. Uh, so yeah, it's a real thing. Um, fortunately, it hasn't affected us at this point right now. I don't really see it changing anytime soon. Maybe um, Q4 or maybe the beginning of next year, things will start getting better. But yeah, even like, even we've seen even a lot of um, turnover in our customer space. Like uh, there's been um, some of our existing customers have, uh, you know, because we are, we service IT support and many service providers and are in the tech space and they've kind of, you know, not churned out, but they've, they've kind of like reduced license counts because of that, 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 that very instance of like uh, trying to do cost savings. So for us as a company, um, it hasn't really affected us other than say maybe our customers base. But uh, as far as like uh, the environment as a whole, it, it's it's real. I mean, yeah, there's uh, there's definitely people looking for opportunities now, and I think they're probably going to find some quality uh, workers for um, for maybe a discount. I don't know. Let's talk about the AI. Uh, what do you think about the generative AI? Uh, and do you think uh, will it actually take jobs? Uh, yeah, one hundred percent. It would. It would one hundred percent take jobs. Um, there's there's no way around it. So what does that mean? Like. It's like when, and that's really, it's not a matter of if, it's just like, when, when is it going to take the jobs? Yeah. Uh, 
I think the AI box is definitely open. Um, and I think probably for the best as far as like, you know, if you want to get like physical, philosophical for the best of humanity, um, you know, people have their varying ideas on if that's going to be the case or not. But for if we want to just keep it specific to us, where I see like uh, us implementing, like say AI for our company is everything from helping us, uh, helping our development team with coding, um, helping us with testing, helping us with, you know, uh, scalability on the back end, being able to uh, really, you know, augment our development team into um, developing quicker, faster, better code, right? And that's scalable. And then for us and from a, you know, a forward facing um, type solution is, Providing, being able to provide like AI capabilities for our customers to do tier one support, uh, being able to provide um, AI uh, chatbots for our customers to service their customers, um, being able to use AI generated reports. Um, so instead of like creating lengthy, um, you know, data reports that shows like the performance of my t- uh, my text team and i want to get that part uh that that trend analysis over the last year those reports can be laborious but with ai uh, generation uh reporting tools you can just do command line prompts and and the ai will create those reports for you i think that's super fascinating and has a lot of like upside potential for our existing platform yeah so it's like does even even from the marketing standpoint, we, we've started even experimenting using AI uh, to help create content, like, right? Um, so if we're looking for specific ideas or topics for that's specific to like IT support and like how to, you know, implement certain like protocols and procedures, we can use AI to help us leverage to initially start the, uh, the, uh, the content and then we'll come back and clean it up. And it's, include and it's increasing like our content development by like tenfold you know so it's like i think i mean we're just on the precipice of what ai is going to be doing not only for our industry but like in medical industry like finance industry education um healthcare whatever and yeah i think i think it will it it will take jobs but it will just allow us to focus on higher level um architectural consulting um you know type um uh, opportunities. All right. And speaking of uh, Sherpa Desk, uh, which AI based functionalities are available in the product right now already? We don't have anything yet as far as like the platform itself. I think I touched on some of the things that we're currently looking at as far as a team. Um, I think the first thing that, you know, we're, we're going to look to roll out is basically taking and indexing our, our KB articles and our content and having it available for, uh, our customers to do tier one support, right? So they have to walk them through like setup, uh, configuration, uh, assisting them with setting up the email parser. So that's, that's going to be our initial launch into the AI space. And we're currently looking to see what's the best method on implementing that for, um, our customer base. Um, uh, but I'm also very curious on um, using AI from that's you know behind the scenes, like in the development space, in the um, testing space, in the scalability space, in the database architecture space. That's going to be something because we always feel like if the platform is sound, scalable, reliable, and secure, you know, it has infinite possibilities. And once we start losing those types of um, those that 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 edge, then you know we start losing customers. And so that's um, so being able to uh, implement AI to keep that uh, part of the technology pretty sound is important to me too. And plus, um, you know, it's it's a whole lot cheaper than bringing on, you know, database administrators and and architects. So, um, yeah, the only way, the only thing that we've implemented AI in this stage of the game is mostly through uh, marketing and content. But um, no, stay tuned. Again, in the next twelve months, we will be rolling out some AI features and functionalities within the uh, the application. All right. How about AI based arts and graphics? Uh, do you use Mid Journey or D- Dali? No. So we do. We don't. Um, so we have a, a graphic art uh, designer that's uh, been with us for, and he's pretty much created the entire. He's from Malta, another um, outsourcing, uh, and so he's created basically the look brand and feel of the sherpa desk uh, app from not only our website but inside the application itself in the ui application itself um in the 
the icons and the in the uh, the UI and the UX. Uh, so no, we haven't really explored um, from the the graphic side of things. Um, is it off the table? No, um, we just don't really need it. Have a need for it at this point. Um, but I am my my purview for AI is completely open. Um, I think it's uh, you. It's it's definitely the tech, the next wave. Of, you know, with Web three point and AI, that's it's you have to embrace it, or um, you're going to be getting left behind. Web three uh, actually involves a lot of blockchain and crypto. Um, do you use crypto? Does Sherpa Desk accept crypto payments? No, we don't. We don't accept crypto at this time. No, it's not. Uh, it, it was actually a discussion when uh, the crypto frenzy was running rampant uh i guess was that a, a year ago uh should we start accepting crypto it's not something that yeah it's not something that we're interested in right now but as far as like blockchain um management of uh, database definitely something inter- uh, i'm interested in again it gets more back to that reliability security but that's such a bigger topic for us to, to convert our, our database model to like blockchain but um uh, nothing that we're going to be focused on at the moment um, with, um, with the blockchain technology. All right, all right. So besides uh, Web3, uh, crypto, and AI, what other tech trends, in your opinion, may become the next big thing? Um, there's, those are, I mean, those are obviously the big ones for our space, but like, you know, the other spaces that um, I see a lot of advancement about, and, and I haven't been able to find any kind of use for us is is just ar and vr right um those are like two big markets that are really starting to um explore crazy possibilities um i don't not sure that where that fits into um our development roadmap but i do like um keeping my finger on the pulse on those types of technologies and i think those are we're again we're just on the on the the top of the the wave on on AR and VR and what we're going to see in that type of technology, whether it's from, you know, professional services using it to deploy into their space or, um, you know, from entertainment to socialization. Um, I just, it's, I've, I've, I've seen some of the, the, the leading technology and it's, it's pretty mind blowing. All right. All right. Let's talk about uh, uh, a company culture. Uh, what's the best way of communicating within uh, an organization, uh, according to you? Uh, well, we have this great tool. It's called Sherpa Desk that uh, we use to communicate uh, pretty regularly uh, with our customers, uh, with um, our development team, with um, uh, with our contractors. Uh, it's really the core piece of um, solution that we use for you know tracking projects, tasks, time and communication now with that being said we also use uh various chats um to do uh communication as well um we still use skype uh, because well, we've had skype implemented for uh i don't know 15 years now and so it's like we didn't want to necessarily make the chat if we, or make the change if we didn't want to but we do use um slack as well as for um, some contractors teams and to do communication i mean you can't get around email. Uh, so email is still a pretty prevalent part of like sending like out of band type messages within, within the team. We use a lot of Google Docs um, to, to communicate um, spreadsheets and um, um, decks and um, some project planning um, that goes on into um, the Google Docs. Those are, I'm, I'm just, I, I like stepping through my day and seeing like, what all different tools I like to use. And those are basically it. the um, Slack, Skype, Sherpa Desk, Google Docs, email. Those are pretty much majority of my communication tools. And what's the most difficult decision uh, that you as a leader uh, had, to, uh, had to make so far? Well, I mean, a lot of it is to grow or not to grow, uh, scale or not to scale. Um, and this is and th- this is still one that I, I struggle with on pretty much a daily basis is, um, you know, I've seen a lot of uh, customers or customers, a lot of um, companies and colleagues that uh, have or had very successful companies and took on capital and now they're no longer available. Um, You know, a 
I think I mentioned I was in an accelerator program in San Francisco. And now there's only, I believe, two companies that are still left out of that accelerator program that are still functioning. Most of them took on capital. They were great ideas. I mean, but uh, the execution wasn't sound and um, they probably got overcapitalized before they knew how to uh, execute. And um, now they're, you know, doing other successful things, right? They failed quickly. We have uh, never taken the the road of failing quickly. We've uh, we've always taken the road of failing gently, and so that's allowed us to uh, um, to continue to stay in business and protecting our downside. Um, so, yeah, it's like you know, it's like you look at the company and it's you know we've we've got customers in I believe nine different countries, just under a thousand logos. Um, uh, we have an excellent renewal rate. And so the struggle is, getting back to your question is, you know, do we take on outside capital, institutional capital and scale this? Or do we continue to, you know, listen to our customers, build a, a, a reliable platform, you know, be excited about what we do and, um, you know, have, you know, autonomy of work and, you know, have like a, a third party company that's, you know, that's constantly you know, demanding, you know, growth and revenue. Um, you know, it's, 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 um, uh, it's a struggle that I, I, I you know, cause I know that there's a lot of opportunity left for Sherpa Desk to continue to scale and, and make a market presence. But at the same time, I know that like our development team is, is very happy with, you know, the, the, the where they are and like where we are. And so it's like, um, yeah, it's to scale or not to scale. I mean, it's, that's the, um, the biggest struggle that I, that I have. Um, I think if you had asked me like 10 years ago, I would have said, yeah, so we, we got to go out there and we got to raise capital and take instant capital and, and be like the uh, the number one leader in the space connect wise. And, you know, uh, but now it's like I've, I have a little bit more perspective and, and know that we have a great customer base, um, a great team, a great product. And uh, I like to continue to foster that. Nice. Nice. I'm a big fan of uh, organic growth as well. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, it's, Organic growth is really like how businesses used to be created, right? Like this whole idea of like pump a, uh, a company up with a m- bunch of capital and then uh, watch it either fail or succeed is a, a, is a new paradigm. Um, and you know, it's like I I tend to I, I tend to like want to go back to like really putting the focus and the time and the energy and the love into the actual company versus like looking at it for some other type of metric means you know but say revenue so uh yeah so we align there too we have a can't, lot in common can't, can't can't agree more um all right and uh as a as a leader how do you help your um your tech team uh deal with the stress and burnouts and uh those negative things in the workspace well i mean you know i mean to put it in like uh real face terms um you know, a big part of our team is in Ukraine. And you can't say that probably this has probably been one of the most stressful times of their lives in probably a thousand years, you know? Uh, and so we're... Uh, we unfortunately, really... unfortunately, less than that uh, since the World War II. Oh, right. Of course. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah. So, well, let, let me just put in their time, uh, in their time frame. And so um, it was... A hundred percent us backing them to giving them the time they needed with their family. Um, we funded some, um, refugee efforts to move to Poland. One guy moved to Poland. One guy moved to Greece. And so, um, when I said earlier that these guys are like family, they totally are like family. And so we give them autonomy at work. You know, it's like there's not, uh, we don't have like hardcore sprints. We don't have, we, we do have product cycles, but it's not, where sprints were like, okay, you need to crush this out for the next 80 hours this week so that we can get this launched. We don't have that type of environment. We do have an environment that um, is very open to their feedback. Um, they provide as much intel into the development process as, as we do. There's, again, uh, I, I'd like to stress that we have a very flat organization. There's, It's not very top down. And, um, and so uh, when it gets to like stress of work, um, we just let them check out. Uh, they, um, they have their holidays. Uh, we don't have a set amount of holidays. You know, if they need to take time off, they say, Hey, I need to take two weeks, which by the way, Ukrainians take like two week vacations. Um, it's like, that's, 
it's very normal. I was like, I don't, I would get, I don't know what I would do with two weeks vacation, but they like to take two weeks vacation. And so that's fine. We let them, you know, that's because of the American vacations that are only two weeks a year. Yeah. Yeah. I guess so. Um, but, uh, no, it's like we, you know, we give them their, in, their holidays, um, that are very specific to them. We allow them to take the, their, um, their vacations. They can set their working hours. Uh, so Igor, um, uh, his, like, uh, he's going to be logging off here in the next, I usually got to catch him before 12. So they have their flex hours. Um, yeah. So it's like, uh, we just listen to their needs and, uh, and we, we, value them i mean that's what i said it's like one of them was planning on leaving uh, this core team i'd be on a plane tomorrow um to to see what's going on so i don't believe there is a lot of stress um in on our team and there's always an open door policy if they ever have any issues um you know we we have our rifts sometimes like you know there's there's like um i wouldn't call fights but like you, you know there's pushback and so you know um Sometimes like the communication is a little bit, um, you know, hard, but like it always gets worked out. And, um, yeah, so it's like, uh, I feel like, it, this, it, we are a very cohesive, cohesive team that, so that, um, um, uh, when they need something, you know, we're, we're there to step up. And sometimes it, if it takes money to like, you know, to relocate or to like help a, their neighbor's friend, I, I, I'll, I'll give you another example. Um, one of uh, Eugene, our application developer, his uh, his house caught on fire. So we helped him rebuild his house. Uh, and so it's like, these are the things that like are important. Um, and so I guess to answer your question, I would be, I've never done it like a survey, but uh, I would be very interested to see if there is any type of stress on the team. So what do you think uh, we, what's uh, uh, the, a, a trait or character, a characteristic that led you to the success that you have today? Well, uh, one is I don't quit. Um, and so I don't like failure. So not quitting and not failure and not having failure are, are like two pretty stubborn qualities that I have. Um, you know, I'm not saying that's actually a great quality either. Um, I think there's a lot of learning that can be done in, in failing. You know, it's like you, we went through a couple of uh, tough times, right? Like, um, in, uh, 2012 was a pretty rough time in the market. Um, uh, you know, right now is actually a pretty tough uh, time in the market. And so we've always found ways to protect our downside um, and be able to stay active and be able to stay true to our customers. Um, and so having this like never quit, um, uh, don't like to, to, to fail and being um, honest and true to like the offering that we say that we're going to do to our customers. I'm really, I'm willing to do anything to, to, to service that. Right. And so, um, I think that's a, it's a good quality trait. Um, I think, you know, when we initially started this, we didn't necessarily envision it scaling to like this size. I think we, we knew that we needed to, uh, create a solution that would, um, help service our need. So we, we developed it out of a need for, um, our own business model. And at that time we were just, we were basically just kids and we're like, Oh, this, it was just, it was fun. And then as time has gone on, it, that fun, uh, turned into a viable business model. And, and I enjoy, um, you know, designing the software company. I enjoy working with the development team. I enjoy seeing, um, our customers, uh, come back with like a lot of, um, you know, happiness that, that it's like, this is awesome. I'm actually like found a solution that works for me. It's like getting that, like, um, that feedback from our customer base is, is, uh, it's rewarding. And, you know, this company's given me an opportunity to do the things that I want to do, like go run the Grand Canyon or, you know, participate in like, um, you know, week long ski trips. You know, it's like, um, it's, it's a very symbiotic relationship that I have with this company, the, what I put into it and what it gets back to me. So it's like, yeah, uh, I don't know if that's answers your question, but I think it's, uh, this unwillingness to pretty much fail is probably a big one for me. Well, I think uh, that doing what you love on a daily basis is the most important thing. And yeah, if you, yeah, I got if you lucky. truly enjoy it, then uh, you'll, you, it will get you somewhere. Sure. Yeah, I got lucky. Um, yeah, I definitely got lucky um, being around people that I enjoy being around and um, in this as- aspect of creating. I think the, cre- the creation comes from like that art background of like 
being able to create something out of nothing and have people enjoy it. I think that's this, you know, it's in a weird way. That's basically what this, this company and this, this, this platform is allows me to, um, to nurture, you know, and, and, and internally. Uh, what do you think is the biggest challenge of being, um, and a CEO and a founder? What's the biggest what challenge? Challenge. Yes. Yeah. I mean, I mean, basically it's, it gets back to that point. Um, you know, it's like, Every CEO's um, mandate, right, is to, as far as I know, grow, uh, is to is to create and grow uh, the organization uh, and set the path forward as far as like it's, um, you know, our our job as a CEO is, is technically a uh, leader that shows the path forward, right, that, that like creates the, the vision and rallies the, the team to go towards that vision. Whatever that vision may be, that's the CEO's job. Right. And then and then they hire the people around them to execute on that vision. Um, so to me, that's the hardest thing. That's the hardest challenge is to continue to, like, set that path forward. Like I am by trade more of a, a product and engineering guy. Like I like to get in the weeds. I like to, like, you know, design the application, design the software. And that's really, I guess, my passion. And so I had to learn to park that and go take off my technician hat and put on my uh, leader hat and set the the path forward and be constantly looking at like, how do we continue to scale and grow this company? And that's a challenge for me. Um, you know, uh, you know, I think certain CEOs got lucky in saying like, say Patagonia guy, like he's Sherard. He, he, he just enjoyed being in nature and like reducing, you know, single use uh, products. Right. And so, like that actually exploded and like, you know, and, you know, the guy still serves or well, he used to he still served, um, you know, um, every day and they allow people to serve. And so like, it's, it's, it's super interesting as, as being a CEO to try to, um, you know, constantly find what is like the, the growth uh, path forward. Um, and, um, you know, it's like, it is a challenge that like, I think only the CEO bears and, and, um, and sometimes I wonder, like, you know, uh, what is the, like, I think that's where you, it's good to find people that kind of augment your skill set to help you. We, we used to have a, a person that it was helpless to, to find that and that's, and that they're no longer with us. And so now it's like the, the onus is on me to like continue to move the, the, the path forward. And so now it's like, you know, do I continue to, to do it myself or find somebody else to help me? Uh, find that vision so that i guess for me that's my personal challenge all right so yeah uh, delegation uh, delegation is very important it is i mean delegation but like setting the path forward and then delegating like it's the vision that's i think certain ceos just provide that like you know the steve jobs of the world or the you know the uh the elon musks of the world that actually set that vision and then being able to execute it on that's that's the challenge of a ceo to, to 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 move the a company forward. All right, all right. Let's talk more about yourself. What's your typical uh, uh, day? Look, uh, what does your typical day look looks like? Well, the mornings are usually with the development team. Um, uh, you know, going through our requirements, doing uh, some testing, providing feedback, uh, doing um, application redesigns, um, answering uh, questions on you know use case and usability. That's that's most of my morning um i do uh stand-ups with the sales and marketing teams on tuesdays uh basically reviewing the metrics and the success we had the week before and then uh focusing on the um the week uh the the week coming up and then measuring it against uh whatever our kpis right like what what we have this quarter that we're kind of focusing on that growth matter so that's that's basically my mornings the second part is uh really focused on um working with the uh the product development or the um customer success team and like learning about okay what's going on with onboarding like what about our our main uh partners as far as uh reselling so we have a few resellers that um take a little bit more of hand holding and it's like strategizing with those guys on like how do we uh look at growth how do we um you know be able to move those guys you know, forward and like selling our product. So 
most of the like the afternoons are kind of focused on either our partners or our top end customers and trying to see like um, what can we do to either convert them or to um, expand on the, those solutions. And then um, I would say scattered throughout my week is operational issues, um, hiring, firing, um, legal issues, um, accounting issues, HR issues, like any type of uh, those extra things that just constantly pop up over um, over the course of the week. And then what I usually do is like I'll take um, I'll take like an hour or two and I either go for like a run or go for a swim or go for a ride. And then just kind of constantly think about like, what is, you know, where are we at and where do we need to go? Right. Um, it's, it's always on my mind. Um, and then right now the, the, the topic du jour is AI. Like how do we, um, how do we move this company forward using AI? Uh, and then how do we move this company forward scaling into the enterprise level space, which I mentioned earlier? Um, how do we change that, that, um, that business, um, dynamic of, we have to lead to um, moving towards account-based selling. So um, that's pretty much in a nutshell. Do you have any hobbies outside of work that help you um, become a better leader? Yeah, I mean, I, so I do a lot of, uh, I, I call it like my carthetic uh, training, which is like um, I do a lot of swimming and running and and cycling. Uh, so it allows me to like basically just step outside of like business, the desk, uh, the, you know, personal life and just kind of like live in my head, um, uh, and just use that time. Sometimes it's an hour, sometimes it's two hours. I, I love going trail running. Um, that's, you know, being in nature and like allowing you to, to, to disconnect and reconnect with your own thoughts without having a lot of like interruptions. Uh, I think these, it's, it's a form of meditation. Uh, I, do do some meditation um in the mornings but but this is more uh of intentional based um checking in and um on myself and like what's going on so i think that's a good and i try to do it at least once a day and it's a good time to like um to like reconnect with myself and thoughts and recharge and you know kind of do like a, a pulse check uh i think it's it's good uh, to mm -hmm. always um kind of like step away for a second and you know check in So I think that's, I think that helps me that stay uh, active, involved in the company. But how many minutes do, do, do you meditate so, at that time? Uh, so in the mornings, I usually do like a, um, like a 15 minute, um, like meditation session, usually when I'm taking the dog out. Uh, and then uh, I usually try to allocate at least an hour, an hour to two uh, a day. Uh, in like that, uh, that kind of cathartic, it, 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 either it's a walk or it's a run, it's a hike, it's a trail run. It's a, just something that, uh, kind of at least allocates myself at that time of day. And then, you know, then I'll come back to, to the work, answer emails or, you know, Skype or whatever. So, uh, do you believe that you have achieved the work life balance? And what's the secret uh, to getting things done while living a mean meaningful and well balanced life? Yeah, I think that's, I mean, first of all, I think that's very important. I mean, I think, I, I don't think anybody, um, I, it's something that it took me a while to actually, um, yeah, to realize. Like, if you'd asked, again, if you'd asked me this question 10 years ago, I'd have probably said no. I'd have probably said, like, I worked a lot. Like, uh, it was, um, you know, seven days a week, you know, I was kind of, stressed out and then you, you kind of hit a point where you're like wait a second you know it's like i don't think anybody sat on their deathbed and they look back over the course of life and said i wish i worked more they nobody's ever said that they they probably said that they they don't they wish they did x or they wish they spent more time with y or you know it's like created more relationships or done more experiences um so it's like i've gotten um pretty i've gotten pretty clear in the fact that like the, that that a work-life balance is important, not only to me, but, you know, the people around me, um, you know, my employees, my personal relationships. So I think I have, uh, to some extent achieved that when, you know, say go out on those runs, those are, those are my time. You know, I always try to like do two things, um, uh, in my life now is, uh, foster deep, meaningful relationships and participate in experiential, uh, experiences. Right. And so those are, I'm always having those type of things that are in the back of my mind when I'm like engaging with people or trying to like set up some type of uh, experiential event, right? Like, you know, I go to Burning Man. I yeah, I go to. Um, That's my plan this to... year. I I just got tickets to to San Francisco on August 20th. 
are you coming? Oh, let's stay in touch, man. Um, so I've got a camp. I started, actually, I started my own camp uh, last year. Uh, so, uh, yeah, this will be my ninth year. Honest, um, I'll, 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 I'll drop by your camp. My friends got a camp, yeah. too. Oh, uh, so uh, really? I'll okay. Them. Yeah, let's stay, let's stay in touch. Um, but, yeah, it's again, that gets back to the um, the experiential um, type of life. It's, like, uh, always opening uh, myself up to, like, uh, learning uh, is, is, uh, also a big part of it too. Um, I, you know, I usually balance my reading between, um, a business type book to like a fictional book, like, you know, outer space stuff, um, uh, science fiction. All right. And do you like traveling? Um, could you recommend, uh, if you could only recommend only one place, what, what, what would that be and why? Okay. So, uh, I'm a huge fan of traveling. Uh, actually my wife is, uh, a bigger traveler than me. Um, but, um, sometimes I get a little bit of anxiety. Like if I go, if I'm away for too long, you know, it's like, I still have, I'm a perfect person for like four or five days and then, you know, coming back to my routine. Um, but you know, I'm still a big fan of, um, the Southwest of the United States, like Arizona, Utah. These are amazing places to do hiking, uh, running, trail running, exploring, uh, waterfalls, rivers, slot canyons, uh, camping. It's really some of the best places in the world. Now, I know that doesn't sound like super adventurous because um, it's in my backyard, but some of the most amazing places I've been is Yosemite, Kings Canyon. Um, it's one of the reasons why I like living on the West Coast is is um is 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 special because we have beaches we have deserts we have um you know mountains uh but with that being said one of my favorite places on the planet is germany um i lived in um swedish moon uh three months uh when i was in high school and then i went back to munchen for um uh for a month during uh in 98 and then lo and behold i end up marrying a german so um uh yeah so it's like uh the south of germany is one of my you know favorite places on the planet to to visit i love the beer i love the sausage i love the people i love the um the the, the culture what do you think about berlin have you been there no man but it's on my list uh so we are um uh, we're spending uh so my daughter is going to be german and so we are going to be living in germany next summer it's just happens to be Euro cup. And so, um, which is awesome. And I want to spend some time up in Berlin. Um, I've been to Germany three times and I've never made it to Berlin. So now it's like, um, if I'm going to be over there for a good stint, I've done most of the South and Western part of Germany, but I've never done uh, Berlin. All right, all right. Well, I lived there for 12 years and, um, oh, really? my, my parents there. So yeah, I'm there from time to time now. I'm super excited. Yeah. It's like everything I've seen that comes out of Germany, um, from the culture, the environment, uh, the, the social life, it's just, uh, very exciting. So it's like, uh, yeah, I'm going to probably try to catch a game up there and spend a couple of days in, in Berlin when, when we're there next summer. Could you share some experiences, uh, traveling Ukraine with me? You said you yeah. I, yeah. I love Ukraine. Um, uh, both Ukraine and Russia, beautiful countries huge amounts of history um the people are uh what i found is very inviting intelligent and yeah just rich in culture and history uh you know it's like one of the things that uh, that always like impressed me about uh, ukraine is that they are the breadbasket of the world right they can literally feed the entire world um in that country um if given the opportunity to do it um so yeah, it's like I've found the architecture uh to be fantastic. Um and um I, don't, I, I love visiting there. Um one of my favorite stories is uh was that the last time we went there, it was it was in January and we were just walking the streets and it was freezing. And uh we went and got a Coke vendor and the uh the Coke uh, vendor uh the the box he was using was actually a heater. And I just thought that was like because I'm in California, just doesn't get that cold. And so I was like, oh my God, it's a heater so that the Coke bottles don't freeze inside the uh, the actual box. So they actually have to heat the bottles instead of uh, cool the bottles. Up. Anyways, I thought that was super fascinating. But yeah, um, yeah, I love the country. It's a, it's a, it's a, I've, you know, again, I have 
some ties to it with my team, but um, overall, it's just like I, I find uh, find it to be great. All right, all right. Would you tell me something that's true that almost nobody agrees uh, with you on? Something that's true that uh, man, that's 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 a tough question. Something that's true that almost no nothing that nobody agrees on. Oh, I'll tell you like something that uh, people like to say like um, like a thousand percent or like like I give one hundred twenty percent. Like you can't give one hundred twenty percent. You can only give one hundred percent. And I don't know if it's like my engineering, but it like it it bothers me. It's like no, no. It's like you know I want you to go out there and give one hundred ten percent, or I I agree with you one thousand percent. I was like no, you can only do one hundred percent. Like um, so it becomes like a, a thing that I like, I'll challenge people on and they're like, but you know what I mean? I was like, yeah, I know, but just, just say a hundred percent. So I don't know. Maybe that's a, like a little idiot signature that I have, but um, I'd say that's probably one. Yeah. Well, th that's the Sheldon moment, right? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose. Uh, what is uh, one business idea that you are willing to give away? Well, I mean, a lot of it's because I've been digging deeply into AI is um, I believe that like, um, you know, obviously, uh, phones are ubiquitous in all of our personal lives. And, um, and I think the, the natural, um, succession of AI is going to be on our phones. Um, I think one of the things, and maybe this is me becoming a new father is you kind of see the destructive behavior between, uh, that's very really correlated between, uh, preteens and teens and their phones and social media. Um, Uh, their phones give them access to social media. That's pretty much how they get access to it. And um, in this country, um, we have a problem. Um, a lot of it has to do with like anywhere from suicide rates to like shootings. And um, and I believe a lot of it is is the genesis comes and the catalyst comes from like how they engage in their social circles um, and which is on their phones. So my idea is putting. AI integrated directly into the phone um, to put it more in like parental controls. Like, um, and you know, I, I've gotten some feedback with some other colleagues and peers. It's like, well, shouldn't parents be parenting? It's like, yeah, of course parents should be parenting. But like, we grew up in a time where like we didn't have phones. And so parents were parents. And now it's not fair that these kids are growing up in times with phones. Um, and so we can do the best we can as a parent. Like, and, but here's the thing. They just like when we, when I was a kid, like we found ways to get around our parents' controls. Like it's it's just the rite of passage. Um, but they have a bigger bullhorn than I did. They don't get the opportunity to fail gracefully. Uh, we had the opportunity to fail gracefully in like micro, like a little micro environment. They fail drastically in major environments because of what these phones and social media can do. So my giveaway is place parental controls in an AI format where like, you know, if a kid is uh, researching content that he shouldn't be researching, let them know. It's like, Hey, you know, it's like, we're not going to show you this content. And um, if it's drastic enough, we're going to alert your parents and say, Hey, um, you know, it's like uh, your kid just uh, looked at this website or looked at this kind of content. And so, um, or like, you know, you want to send like what you don't understand is a hate message or you don't understand is a bullying message. Uh, because you're not mature enough to understand that what, what the difference is, the AI agent will intercept that text or intercepts that post and say, hey, look, um, we're not going to post that. This is the reason we're not going to post that because, you know, this could be detrimental to uh, the individual, this could be detrimental to like how you are proceeding at school, or are you going to be removed from school? So it would just give you real-time feedback and conversations when like a parent is not able to step in, the AI agent can kind of override it and you can kind of, uh, you know, throttle those kind of controls. Again, I don't think it should replace parenting. I think parenting is where it should start, but you know, uh, kids will, are going to be kids and they're constantly going to make mistakes. And again, I don't think it's fair that they get a bullhorn when they make those mistakes and they should be able to fail gracefully. And so having an AI agent integrate into the, um, either the iOS or the Android to like, to minimize that would be an amazing piece of technology so somebody go out there and develop that well a good influence uh, on your kid would be uh, uh, you know becoming popular on, on the social media <laughs> so that would that? right with you <laughs> yeah yeah right um yeah i mean obviously there's content that's like you know acceptable on social media but like just stop it before it actually gets out of hand you know it's like and just and see if it's like you can provide a little micro teaching moment um with them when they're making those mistakes 
All right. And there, there's also been a Black Mirror episode on this, on uh, uh, p- parental uh, surveillance. Remember that one? Yes. The yeah. I love Black Mirror. You know, they're coming out with another season. I'm still... Really? When? Yeah. Uh, they just announced that uh, there's, you can look at the trailers. It's uh, They're actually bringing um, some uh, known celebrities, which I never thought is like necessary because Black Mirror is more about the... Uh, the, the the content than the actual person that's uh doing the acting but no it's like black mirror is by far one of the best shows nice um, nice gotta yeah gotta watch the trailer Lo- I, I love yeah. black mirror yeah yeah i hope to, to see some new episodes soon have you ever seen you uh, watch love love death and robots that's of course movie. yes big fan yeah okay yeah figured you like the same kind of stuff yeah, well, you know, IT people all around the world, right? right cons- yeah, consume exactly. pretty much the same, um, you know, content, <laughs> yeah, exactly. con- con- yeah. content. Yeah. yeah, it's good. It's good to know there's more people out there like us. All right, all right. Any tips for entrepreneurs launching a uh, SaaS company in today's super competitive market? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, my, I always tell first first thing I say is like, don't do it. Um, is like, uh, it's, there's there's a lot of uh, safety and getting a job and being talented and like uh using your um skills and uh talents on a team um that uh, you don't have to go through the stress and the the heartache and the troubles and the the blood sweat and tears and like trying to start a SaaS company especially in today's competitive market is absolutely yeah it's it's tough it's it, so i would say don't do it now if you're still going to do it well then that's the kind of uh, mentality and, and personality that um, that you just, that, that, you know, that you're going to do it anyways. And so if those people are still going to say, you know, I'm going to do it anyways, then that's, that's who, then I'll have another conversation with you is like, well, the first thing to do is get very, very specific on what you're going to do, um, is find out who that market is and put a box around it. You know, it's like one of our biggest mistakes and growing pains is we try to scale too big too fast and try to go too wide against too many markets we thought we were going to be the google uh, professional service automation and what we kind of found out is we were running before we even knew how to crawl and so i would tell them to yeah find you know i mentioned earlier getting that mvp out is not that hard of a thing so do that like get your mvp out get some adoption make sure it's very focused on what you do and just put your blinders on um, and say, look, hey, uh, we are solving a specific need and um, and we're going to service that to the best of the ability and we're going to make sure the customers are happy. And um, and that's going to be our focus. You know, once you get that, then you're kind of a, then you're a business. Now you got to do all the other things like hiring and firing and scaling and um, and legal and payroll and all that other stuff. that's like not really fun. So, yeah, I mean, my first my first thing was, hey, don't do it. And if you're going to do it anyways, I was like, get super focused and super razor sharp and define what you are going to do and how you're going to be successful and why you're going to do it better than anybody else for that specific market. Patrick, is there any advice you would give to your younger self? Yeah. You know, I, I don't know. Like, um, I spent, a, you know, a good portion of my 30s working a lot. I think some relationships suffered over that. So I think I would tell myself to keep a lot of, perspective about like really you know the time we have on this like we can get like super like cosmic and philosophical the time we have on this planet um shouldn't be really used uh to uh really stress about too much you know it's like you know when i say we have what 45 years of really maximum potential because like the first 20 years you know we're kind of too young to really do anything in the last 20 years we're kind of too old to do anything so it's like it's that 45 sweet spot that's like like our our time to really kind of live and explore and experience and create relationships and and like even starting a company is experiential like um and it's creating relationships and so i would say like put more of that perspective in scope uh versus you know like constantly feeling anxiety and stressed and like you know, so I spend a lot of sleepless nights, like panicking about, like, oh, you know, are we going to be able to make payroll, and are we going to be able to, like, you know, scale this company? And I was like, you know, if you don't, that's fine. You know, it's like I always say, like, my biggest thing is like nobody's going to come and eat you. You know, it's like it's like you fail and you move on. So I would tell that person, uh, that person in his thirties, 
is to keep more of a perspective lens and kind of um, be open to like not necessarily focus so much on work. You know, it's 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 kind of like you know hindsight's fifty or hindsight's twenty twenty because like you know that work and that uh, front loading that I did in the thirties has given me this opportunity to have that perspective now. So I, I definitely appreciate that. But like I don't know, I, I would just definitely say that the, that that decade was kind of lost time from just a lot of um, things that I could have been doing um, earlier because of life being short. Yeah, it comes down to to the work life uh, balance, right? Yeah, yeah, it's. I mean, that's that sums it up. Is focus more on that. Um, everybody should focus more on that. Um, it's it's way more important. What's one book you recommend? Uh, you would recommend our audi- audience uh, should read and why? Well, I was so it was a book that my dad gave me. Uh, it was his favorite book, and then uh, I've read it twice. Uh, it was called Atlas Shrugged. It's. Um, I know a lot of people have like their opinion about Ayn Rand and Ayn Randism, and um, you know what does it means to like. Um, like e- economic and um, social constructs, but like the the core of the book is super. I, I find it super fascinating uh, because basically it focuses on you know thought capital, like who is the brain capital and um, and what does that mean for society. And I think a lot of times we tend to um, demonize uh, like uh, innovators and creators and people that um, are really uh, pushing the uh, the envelope forward for society and economics and humanity. I mean, like, I'm sure if you did a popularity count of Elon Musk, uh, he probably wouldn't be favoring pretty high, but the guy is actually changing the world as far as like how we see space travel, how we, I mean, how we see uh, electric vehicles and how we do transportation. Um, but, you know, People just don't like him. Um, and I was like, fine, you don't have to like him, but look at the impact that he's having on society. So that's, you know, that's Atlas Shrug in, in a nutshell is like giving some type of um, uh, perspective of the entrepreneur, or perspective of the capitalist. And like there's this guy in the book, Hank Rudin, who's probably my idol of all time. And, you know, he's, he's that guy that does not want to fail and he has an idea and, um, it's blue steel. I don't know if you, if you ever read the book, but like, and so, uh, and he was unwavering his, uh, uh, commitment to scaling the business and, and he wasn't going to be affected by like, you know, whatever government and in, in the sense of like, um, being, I think they, she called them beggars, um, that were constantly trying to, um, bring his company uh, into like a, a more of a social perspective of, of how to operate a company. So uh, yeah, I, 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 I appreciate the book. I appreciate the, the, uh, the thought behind it. Uh, you know that the book's author uh, was uh, born and raised, raised in Ukraine before moving to the United States. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. I, I've seen plenty of her interviews. She's a fantastic, interesting lady. Yeah. Uh, and, and like, like I said, you can agree with her. You don't agree with her, but the lady had ideas and so that's what i can appreciate yeah all right all right uh and to wrap this up uh the last question what's your life motto uh i don't really have uh i think a life motto like a mantra i think my dad had one he had put it on his desk um but um and i can't really share it here but but like for me it's always been about now I mean, it always change. You know, things change as you as you kind of get perspective in life. But my my life model now, and we've touched on it before, is I really want to focus on um, creating experiential experiences and 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 fostering deep relationships. Uh, I think those two things, and whether it be professionally or it be personally, uh, those are like the two things that I am constantly uh, striving for. Um, whether yeah, it's like. You know, if I'm doing those two things, then I know I'm being successful, uh, both personally and professionally, like, um, you know, with my team, as well as with uh, the platform and the company. Um, you know, you can always look at experiences being different things. Um, you know, it's like uh, experiencing um, uh, new markets or experiencing new uh, trade shows or experiencing um, uh, new technology. So uh, those are the, the things that I really try to, like, reflect on a lot as far as they're the only things that that i see that gives me value anymore 
Um, everything else is more of a depreciating asset. And those are the only things that I've seen as being appreciating assets. All right. All right. Got it. All right. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you for taking the time again and for the insightful conversation. I really appreciate it, Constantine. It's uh, it fun. It was good to, uh, to get a catch up and put a name to face. And, um, yeah, I'm glad yeah, you, were, you guys were able to set this up. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.